Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Okay, so I want to talk for a little bit tonight. I made the title of this message, When You Wish Upon a Star. Um, and there's a reason for that in a moment. It kind of it kind of hooks into what I've been saying over the last few weeks. And also, I wasn't due to speak tonight, but I, I didn't want the guys who've been working so hard on the grotto to, to take on extra work and burn. Thanks, guys, as well, for what you've done. The grotto's been... Incredible again, and all the hard work, and uh, just one more day to go, but it's been a sellout and, uh, and a success. Okay, so Isaiah 9-2, I want to come back to again. It's, um, it's, it's a real Christmas prophetic text written 700 years before the birth of Christ. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Sometimes we don't recognize when we're living in darkness and we don't recognize sometimes when we're living under the shadow of death. And uh, kind of that was the case because Jesus who was the light, he was the answer. Uh, when he turned up, the people who Isaiah had said were walking in darkness and living in the shadow of death think, didn't think that they were at all. So anyway, I want, I want to talk a little bit about this tonight. I've got one picture for you tonight. Remember we had the pictures last week of my dad and his, his uh, sister and brother. That's yours truly. Good looking lad. Christmas. A grands. There's no central eating in those days. Hence the really fashionable little cardigan that kind of wasty cardigan and chilled. That's got nothing to do with what I want to say. I just thought I'd show you it. Okay, so there's a song. When you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart desires will come to you. If your heart is in your dreams, no request is too extreme. When you wish upon a star, as dreamers do. Like a bolt out, out of the blue, fate steps in and sees you through, <clears throat> when you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. Now I thought in, 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 in the context of what we talked about for the last few weeks, that, that could be the hymn of the millennials, couldn't it? From what we described. The problem is that it, it, it's actually Disney as opposed to reality. You can wish on as many stars as you want but it's not going to make your dreams come true. Now, there is something called the law of averages that unfortunately can be pulled in by some people who want to do research to prove the point, which is that if you ask enough people whether they wished on a star and whether their dream come true, you'll find a few people whose dream came true, but it wasn't because they wished upon a star, but if you take those names and put them in a book and say this is the way to do it, everybody will believe that if you wish on a star correctly, your dream will come through. I, I, I have some problem with some Christian books in that way because making big promises, but then it also gives you the 57 reasons why your faith is not producing or why you didn't receive your healing. And I, I don't think that's helpful, and I don't think it's appropriate. So, so wishing on a star might not be the best thing. Now, being a little corny, one could... One could argue that, um, you know, in, in the Christmas story, that there was a few guys who wished upon a star, or at least they, they put the money on the star and figured the star would lead them somewhere. And thankfully, on that occasion, it did. But we'll talk about that in just a little minute. So, so remember last week I said that the moment is never just the moment. That's a very important point. The moment is never just the moment. What we want as individuals and what we need may be and are most often two different things. 
where we want to be and where we need to be are most often two very different things. What we want to do or not do and what we need to do or not do are most often two very different things. Now, in the Christmas story as recorded in Luke and Matthew, the first two chapters of each of those books, which I've read very extensively over the last few weeks, um, all these principles come into play and what they produce is game-changing moments. Doing what you want rarely makes a game-changing moment. But more often than not, what changes the game is not something that you want, it's something that you need. And unless you're guided to the recognition of that need, you'll only ever chase what it is you want. But as, as Simon Sinek said the other week, we want beanbags and we want coffee. But when you give them beanbags and coffee, they're not happy. Because while ever we are driven by our wants, what we want, I think this will make me happy, I want this, I want that to happen. It rarely does produce in us when we've got what we want, what we hope that it would, which is why there are so many happy people who have, unhappy people who have so much. We can look at society today and, and talk about need, but actually... Our society is across the board prosperous compared to society 100 years ago. You know, you get pregnant now, you're not going to get sacked by your boss, you're not going to get rejected by your parents, and your kid's not going to be born in a workhouse like my great-grandfather, which I told you the story last week. But there's never been a time in history where we had so much and yet were so dissatisfied. Because we've somehow learned to be driven by, by the buzz of getting what I want rather than the fulfillment of getting what I need. And, and of course, one takes effort. The other one doesn't take as much effort. So, how many are familiar with that term game changer? Okay, are you familiar with that? With game changing moments... That, that's moments that, that change the course and the outcome of the game. And from that moment on, things are never the same. Now, hooking back into last week, I have to pull a little thought in, in, into now, which is that all stories begin and have the bulk of their content long before the notable moment that everyone remembers. Remember, we talked about that last week. The content's going on, but the notable moment, the moment is never just the moment. The question is how much of that bulk of content is actually trying to push us toward the moment that will bring redemption to it all. That actually somehow, even in the bulk of the difficult things in life, there is a process going on trying to push us towards Redemption. Now we can resist that push, which we often do in the context of dealing with our history, but there is a bulk of stuff and it's trying to push us towards redemption. Now remember, redemption is when something's bought back, it's redeemed, it's returned back to you, something that you originally had, but you have now, now lost. See, see, redemption is a wonderful Christmas word. And uh, Jesus came to redeem and redemption pushes our story. It pushes it that way. It pushes it the way to find redemption. Now, nowhere will you find this more prevalent than in these two chapters I talked about. Matthew chapter 1 and 2 and Luke chapter 1 and 2. Which give us really the essence of Christmas story of two different aspects of that, that story. And, and within the detail of that, of the wider Christmas story, there are many characters and many things going on. We look at those chapters and it's the story of Jesus being born, but actually Jesus being born is only a moment within the story. But moments are never just moments. 
And so within those two chapters, we've got these things going on. There's the barren woman by the name of Elizabeth, who's never been able to have a child, whose concern is, I'm barren, I would like a child, I don't have a child. There's the frustrated priest, her husband, Zachariah, who's never become a father, which is important in that culture, and now gets his one time in the temple to, to light the incense and gets visited by an angel in the temple. There's the frightened teenager who you know as Mary. So, oh yeah, we've all got this thing, yeah, of course, the angel came and Mary already had a halo on and she was kind of, yep, just bring it on. No, no, what, what was being proposed was a process like I told you about my paternal grandfather's name being Chapman when his mother's name became changed to Haywood so he still carried the shame that was in the name and we have that name, that maternal name because within all of these processes this was a frightened teenage girl called Mary who would have to face the prospect of shame and humiliation in the society and imagine explaining that I'm pregnant but it wasn't Joseph. There's a doddery old man by the name of Simeon who's having trouble dying. He's very old and he's ready to die, but he said, I couldn't die until my eyes saw the salvation of God revealed to the people. Such was his desire. He's waiting to die. He needed a moment that allowed him to go. <coughs> There's the vigilant widow called Anna who was married for seven years and her husband died and then kind of obviously broken-hearted and difficult, she committed all her life in the temple praying for other people, believing for other people, caring about other people. She was one of those within the moment. There's the Iranian or Iraqi astrologers, depending on your ge geography. I love the fact that astrologers... See, we don't put that in the Bible because we can't handle it. Can't handle it. Magi, M-A-J-I, Magi, fortune tellers astrologers who read the stars. So we don't like telling people that, do we? Because it's like, no, we, we can't have people coming to find Jesus through the astrology. Well, the astrology was the only means that they had to have a revelation in another culture of the Savior that was coming. They needed a moment as astrologers. And then there's the jealous king by the name of Herod who was actually fuming because they came and told him that a king was born and he was the king and he couldn't rejoice. His heart was full of jealousy. He couldn't embrace a moment that would have changed the whole direction of his kingdom. All he could do was being jealous. All these are the story within the story. This is the backstory. This is the bulk. And yet all of this was trying to push all of them towards redemption. But none of it was comfortable. The lowly shepherds, very low down in society, disregarded, outcasts in many, many ways, needing a moment. The innkeeper, who's got the problem of people talking about him 2,000 years later, saying that blooming innkeeper had no room for Jesus in the inn. Right? He hasn't been written up well, has he? No room. Well, it was a moment in his life, a moment of decision, a moment of choice. <coughs> You've got the, the census called at that time that was called, that, that made the whole thing happen. All of these are moments significant within the bigger story. There's the need to go to Bethlehem. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I remember, you know, we, we have cars, and I remember when Chris was heavily pregnant with Joel, uh, insisting that she go with me to to home groups that we were leading in Selby at that time that was in a bit of a dingy building with a horrendous toilet, I mean, just not good. And uh, she would throw up on the way there, and then she'd have to, th it was better throwing up in the field at the side of the road, actually, than, than, than the toilet. Now, so t tell me that when the census was taken, and news came you had to go to the place of your birth, and Mary's heavily pregnant, that Joseph thought, oh, that's cool, that's brilliant, be a li nice little trip. I propose to you that he didn't want to go to Bethlehem, but he needed to go. 
There are some times where we want to, don't want to go places and we need to go, but there are some times when we want to go places and we don't need to go. Because moments are hanging on it. And this part of their decision to go to Bethlehem is not an isolated thing. It's all interconnected. And some of you have forgotten that life is interconnected. You don't just say, oh, well, I'd like to do that, so I'll just do that. Well, that's fine, but the consequences, and I don't mean judgment, right? Consequences, the connected sequence of events, you may not be prepared for what that will do. Joseph would have had a legitimate reason to say, Mary's pregnant. We can't go there. We'll make up some excuse. I don't want to go. But you see, some things we need to do. Some places we need to be. Then the escape to Egypt. They warned in a dream. Joseph warned in a dream that Herod was killing the babies. The Jesus is now probably one to two years old. He's not the little toddler in the thing. And now Joseph doesn't want to go live in Egypt, but needs to go live in Egypt. And as they return back to Nazareth, which was not the bustling metropolis of, you know, desire of, well, let's go live in Nazareth. All these things are connected, but all of them are significant motive, uh, 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 moments. There's, there's detail within the wider story that you cannot begin to separate it because the bulk of the story is actually trying to pull all, push all of these people towards redemption. It's not just about Jesus being born. It's about Elizabeth, the barren woman, having the kid that she longed for. It's about Zachariah, the frustrated priest, getting the revelation that he's been desiring. It's about the old guy who's saying, I'm done. Listen, I'm too old. My body hurts. I need to leave. It's about him being able to say, I can lay on my pillow tonight. I can close my eyes and I can go into the next life because I've seen the revelation of the salvation of God. It's about these astrologers finding what it was that they thought they were looking for that was greater and more powerful than anything they'd ever experienced in all their journey. It's about all of these things being pushed towards redemption. Now here's what's fascinating. All of those things were difficult. All of those things were things that you could easily make a decision to avoid or go somewhere else or do something else or think something else because all of them had with them an element of discomfort. It could not be about what you would like to do or what you wanted to do. It had to be about knowing what you needed to do. And for all of these who grasped what they needed to do, redemption changed their story. What about us? Each of these moments became a game changer for those who would let it push them towards redemption. So the question is, are you letting your story push you towards redemption? You say, well, how can it? Because there is a force, there is a power behind that story, which is the same power that was behind the nativity story, pushing, 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 pushing. That's why the words of Mary in, 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 in Luke chapter 2 are so powerful. And having looked at it all, she said, let it be to me as you have said. Or in other words, I'm prepared to be pushed into redemption. Sometimes we're guilty of getting so stuck in what I talked about last week. Remember, I, I gave you a little way to, to think about what history is. History is the thing that shouts out to you, Hi, I'm your story. And that's why history can be such a problem to some of us because we find it difficult that when we're just trying to get our minds off what has happened and we're, we're trying to resolve the frustrations and the pains of our life, the history crops up and says, Hi, I'm your story. 
And unless redemption comes in there, that will never change. But you see, you see, the whole idea of telling us the story around Jesus' birth and not just, oh, and by the way, God made a virgin pregnant and Jesus was born. Why does it tell us the story around it? Because it's trying to show us that the things that jump up and say, hi, Elizabeth, I'm your story. You desperately wanted a child. You haven't got one, you're barren. You're never going to be happy. Those kind of things that crop up in our life. Hi, Mary. You know you're going to be shamed. Hi, I'm your story. Those are the things that the extensive story around the nativity are given for us to show that all of that can be pushed into a place of redemption. And that's what it's all about. So sometimes we're guilty of getting so stuck in the Hi, I'm your story, that we don't press through to our moment of redemption. We don't push on to our Bethlehem. We don't go take our place in the temple to light the, to light the incense where the angel's going to show up. We, we, we don't turn up in the temple courts like Anna, where the visiting child who's now being circumcised on the eighth day, he's going to be so that we can... We can see her. We, 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 we don't get on the camels and say, if this takes a week, a month, a year or two years, which it probably did take closer to a year. <clears throat> we don't say, I'm going to get on there if it takes me a year, but I'm going to find what it is that this star is pointing to. I will, there, there are more comfortable options, more enjoyable options, but those options may not be reeking with destiny like this option that comes in the moment of finding your place in that game changer. Now, again, just to repeat last week, because this is important to pull through, we have no control over the backstory of our lives. It is what it is. Other people were in control of that. Other circumstances played their part in the backstory of our life. And... Uh, for most of it, we're not to blame for what it produced. I uh, told you some about my family last week. I told you about how, you know, not only was my grandfather born in the, the workhouse in shame and disrepute, but then when my grandfather uh, was born, grew up, married my grandmother, and then had that tragic accident when my dad was four years of age and was killed, and then grandma comes home with little Albert sat on the curbside holding hands with some guy who he'd never met saying, this is your new dad. Well, um, you can't replace a dad like that. You just can't. It just... <clears throat> so I'm very conscious of some of the pains and, and um, uh, hi, I'm your story that my dad had to walk through. This, the guy who, who came with, with grandma, who became my dad's stepdad, of course, they were never adopted either. They remain Chapman's. His name was Jack Platt. And Jack was an abuser. He abused my grandmother. And I told you, my father and his brother had a coal poker. And they told Jack Platt, if we're ever in the house and you abuse mother, we will kill you. <clears throat> and he knew they were telling the truth. But then I have to have grace for Jack Platt. Because one day when my dad was a little older, he was talking to Jack. <clears throat> and... Uh, Jack was telling Dad about the nightmares he used to have. And he started to unfold some of his story. This was in about 19... This would be about 19... Let me see, 26, 36. This would be about 1940, 41. At the end of the First World War, Jack Platt was in the Navy and was in a small boat landing some men on the coast, when there were German guns, gun emplacements. And as Jack's going into the shore, he's talking away to his, his, his mate, his best mate, and smoking. And he's talking and talking, and they heard the shelling start, and they're talking and talking and talking. However, when my dad's stepfather turned to look at his friend, all that was left was his chest from here down to his legs, still leaning on the boat side. And that happened while, while my dad's stepdad was taught. Then you wonder, 
why sometimes people become abusers. Abu abuse is never acceptable. There's never an excuse for it. But there are always pains, there are always issues, there are always moments in people's lives that we have to take into regard when we're dealing with people and helping people so that we help them to change what he's saying, hi, I'm your story, and get a redemption for that. No control over the backstory. Yet every backstory, listen to me, this is really, really, really important. Every backstory creates situations we must face and asks us questions we need to answer. Our natural reaction to the backstory is to find a way not to face it and to make sure we never have to answer the questions that the backstory is asking of us. One of the questions the backstory was ask of us is, why are you doing that? And because some of you tonight won't face the situation of the backstory or answer the questions it's ask, asking you, you are compensating by getting caught up in all kinds of addictions and compulsions and things that you are trying to use to satisfy the need that has been created by the backstory, that if you would face the issues and answer the questions that the backstory is asking, because we all do things for a reason. Even what we would call the sins that we do are for a reason. They are a consequence and a result of the backstory. That's why redemption is so important, because our backstory, when that gets redeemed, it changes who we are today. It changes the moment. So we can say Christ is born today. But Christ was only born today because the situation of the backstory and the questions it's asked were being answered. And when Christ is born today, that's the game changer right there. But if we don't address that, we continue to live under the shadow of the history the backstory, the situations that we face, and the questions that we won't answer. We're here to help you with that if we can in any way. Never be any condemnation. But we want to help you. So the question is, with all of that, with, with my father's, stepfather's story, with my story last week, with the story of all these characters that get thrown into Matthew 1 and Luke, uh, Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2, that are all part of this because it's game changing moments, redemption for every moment, whether you're an astrologer from Iraq or whether you're the Virgin Mary who will be put in statues in some churches 2,000 years later, whichever one you were, there was redemption for the story, whether you're the little old lady who got widowed at seven years into the marriage and is still struggling with the loss of a husband but looking for redemption, whoever you were in that scale, there was a moment in this that would break out. And the question is, how would all this look through the eyes of redemption? I want you to look at your life tonight. Especially the secret bits that either nobody or very few people know. And we can all look saintly like secret bits. What, what secret bits? We all got those secret bits. All got the secret pains, the secret struggles, the secret sins. The secret addictions, the secret compulsions. But how would this look through the eyes of redemption? How would the pain of that, the guilt of that, the struggle of that, the dissatisfaction with that, the lack of self-worth, how would all that look through the eyes of redemption? See, because that's what a light has dawned means to those living in the shadow of death, to, to those in darkness, a light dawn. It, it means that we begin to look at it through the eyes of redemption. 
That's why Jesus came to be Redeemer. He came to be Redeemer. He came to redeem people's story. He came to step into the, hi, I'm your story, and recover what was lost. And replace and restore and heal and forgive. When, when your situation, your backstory, asks the questions that you need to answer, what would your answer be through the voice of redemption? I know I don't do this enough. I, 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 don't, I don't answer the questions my backstory asks this enough through, through the voice of redemption because it, it's far easy to answer it through the voice of condemnation. It's rather easy to answer it through the voice of guilt. It's easier to answer it through the voice of shame. It's easier to answer it through the voice of putting yourself down, of being a failure, but to answer it through the voice of, of redemption. What's the voice of redemption sound like? It sounds like the angel to Zachariah, hey, I've seen your pain, but here's the deal. You thought you were barren, but you're not. And I want you to go home now. I want you to sleep with that little lady of yours, Elizabeth, because here's what's going to happen, okay, old man? Not only are you going to produce... But what you produce will be a voice to the nations, a voice that's still been spoken about in 2,000 years' time. What you're going to produce will allow Jesus to come. He'll smooth the way for, for Jesus to come. Redemption sounds like the angel to Mary. Hail you, highly favored. Who am I, right? Who am I that my Lord would do this? Who am I? That was Mary's point. But the voice of redemption says, highly favored, that's who. How can these things be? Use the old version because I learned all the stories in that. Since I knew not, know not a man. It's like, well, didn't, if you're younger, it's like, well, didn't she know any guys? Good question. How can this be? Well, here's the deal. There's a redemption going to happen. That's what redemption sounds like. And I propose to you, as I said to you earlier, that all these stories were being pushed towards, pushed towards, pushed towards a moment of redemption. I don't want you to miss your moment of redemption. It takes a little boldness, a little bravery, actually, to receive that moment of redemption because it means that your history can no longer say, hi, I'm your story, because now you have a new story that says to answer your question about my worth, about my value, about my righteousness, about my worthiness, about who I am, here's the answer, I'm highly favored. The Holy Spirit's come upon me just like he did on Mary. And that which has been born in me is called the Son of God. Heaven is inside. My story has been Redeemed. The wonderful thing is, of course, that in the redemption of the story of all these individuals, there was a redemption story that was touching the whole world, the planet, creation itself, was being redeemed by this miracle. You had to have a virgin birth, you had to have a resurrection if you were going to redeem creation because what happened had to be contrary to the power of creation. The power of creation says, you're a virgin, you can't have a child. Redemption says, yes, you can. Normality says, you don't have what it takes. You don't have the resources. Redemption says, yes, you do. Creation says, you're dead. You can't live again. Redemption says, yes, you can. Creation says, death is the end. Redemption says, death is the beginning. It's redemption story, redeeming the whole world. 
So, let me finish here. One more Bible verse, just so you know I'm biblical. Matthew 2, verse 6. It's a wonderful statement of this very redemption I've taught you about. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah. Bethlehem was a two-bit little nothing. It was a meeting place for shepherds and travelers. It was despised, just like Nazareth was. But 700 years before this happened, here's what Isaiah said. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least, right? Redemption's talking now. Society says, Bethlehem, Bethlehem what? But redemption says, you are not the least. The back story says, worthless. Redemption story says, worth more than value could ever be put on it. You Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you, out of you, out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. To all of us Bethlehems in here tonight, we have a promise, out of you. That's redemption's voice. The backstory says, hi, I'm your story. He's not talking to you, can't be you. Not with the story you've had, not with what you've thought about God. Not with what you think about church and Christianity and faith and Jesus and your struggles. Not you. That's what your backstory will say. Hi, I'm your story, not you. But that's why consistently in the language of the Spirit of God in Scripture, it tries to come to say, you might think you're a Bethlehem, but here's what redemption says. Out of you comes the ruler who will shepherd my people Israel, the moment I want you to grasp this Christmas season is the moment of redemption. Redemption. Christ is born, wonderful. But what about redemption? Jesus is the Son of God, wonderful. But what about redemption? All you're giving me is detail. All you're giving me is facts. And that's why it's not just an empty story. It's like this person, 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 this place, this place, this place. Let's bring it all in because it's a moment. It's a game-changing moment for redemption. And, and I, believe, I believe there's a moment for you to change the game. To change the life. To, 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 to change the story. To redeem back what was taken, stolen, lost, broken. Redemption story. You, Bethlehem, you're not the least. You, James, you're not the least. You, Chris, you're not the least. You're not the least. Not the least. Not the least. Out of you. Redemption. Redemption story. But you see, the thing about a moment is you have to believe it, receive it, and take it. And it always starts with a choice. Okay, Mary, here's the deal. Her response, let it be to me, as you have said. All she, all she could think to do is say, well, I, I want to grab this redemption moment. So, so whatever it is you've said, let it be. Totally life transforming, but also world impacting. Life transforming, world impacting. The one who is born in you. I want that for you tonight. Let's just bow our heads just for, just for a moment. We're, we're not going to take long at all on this. We're just going to take a few seconds. But if you'd like to be included in a prayer of confession tonight that says, I'm grabbing this moment. I'm making a declaration. I, I, want, I want to hear what redemption says about my story. If, if you'd like to be in that prayer, well, everybody's head bowed, every eye closed, just raise your hand real quick, just, just, this, just that indicator, I want to be included in redemption's story, I want to hear what redemption is saying about my life, okay, we're going to pray right now, I want, I want you just to, to pray this little prayer, 
want you to pray this little prayer. After Everybody can pray this, okay? I, I don't mind. It just helps everybody. Everybody pray this. I want you to pray this. Father, in Jesus' name, I receive the redemption you have given in this moment as the game changer in my life. I thank you for grace. I thank you I don't have to earn it. <clears throat> but you've said I deserve it. Not because of what I've done or not done. But because you've promised me that I can have this redemption. I make it mine today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Father, I just pray over the powers that grip us, the things that make us slaves and, and conquer our lives, hearts, thinking, emotions, behaviors. I pray right now that the spirit that's driving them will break in Jesus' name because of redemption, that the spirit will break. I pray for freedom to come, wholeness, restoration, and redemption from all those things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I think we're done. So, we love you. We bless you. And uh, bring somebody on Friday. All right, we're, we're done. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. Then why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.